You may be seated. Well, good morning. Our scripture text this morning comes to us from Judges, chapter 9, verses 7 through 15. It was our first scripture lesson this morning. Uh, Before we begin with this very interesting parable uh, in uh, Judges, everyone's favorite book of the Bible, right? Uh, Let me open us with prayer. Father, we uh, are your sheep. You're the shepherd of your pastor. We, uh, your pastor, we ask you to be with us now, uh, to feed us. We open our mouths. Will you do what you have said and fill them? Fill them with your word. Sanctify us in your truth. Thy word is truth. And we pray that you would be in our midst, working as you already have done during this service. Be with your people. And as your word is proclaimed, help us uh, to not be hearers only, but be doers, uh, going forth from here, living in light of your truth and your word. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. The first question we must ask as we consider this uh, parable by Jotham in Judges chapter 9 is, what is a bramble in the first place? And this, this will be you know, fleshed out throughout the sermon, but what is a bramble? Well, at first, literally, uh, a bramble is a, a type of thorn bush uh, and we're unsure exactly, you know, the exact scientific species that is being referred to here by the Hebrew word a tod. Uh, but we do know it was a pretty destructive type. It was easily set on fire. Uh, it's used in Psalm 58.9, uh, which indicates in that psalm that they used it for a firewood because it's lit on fire pretty quickly. Um, and they grow very fast. They're often invasive. They often choke out the life uh, of other plants around them. Uh, in Israel, they, they can provide some shade. That is possible. Uh, but it's definitely not a shade tree. You definitely don't want to find shade under its branches. Uh, eventually, it would cause you bodily harm if you did. It's a pretty thorny bush. Uh, not a good idea to find shade there. Uh, and now, as we will see in our passage also, figuratively... A bramble is a person who seeks control and power uh, no matter the cost of those around them. That's a bramble. Uh, In the the book and the movie, I haven't read the book, but I've seen the movie, Dune, in the first movie, uh, the Duke of the House of Atreides, do I have that right, Cody? I have that right, okay. Uh, He is our, our Dune correspondent. Uh, the Duke of the House of Atreides tells his son, the main character, Paul, he says this, this is a great quote. He says, A great man doesn't seek to lead. He is called to it, and he answers. It's a great quote. That's not like a bramble. See, a bramble is a person who abuses authority or, uh, authority or even unjustly uh, takes authority that never belonged to them in the first place. Uh, he is a, a man that wants to lead even if he is completely unfit to do so. Uh, This is a man who wants power and control over people. Right? That's what they want. They want to be a bramble and have people under their thumb, in their grasp. That is a bramble and that is Abimelech. Um, And that's who we will be talking about mostly in our sermon, in this sermon this morning. And so our, our big picture is this. What we will see is that authority will be stripped away from those who rule for the sake of their own gain. Authority will be stripped away from those who rule for the sake of their own gain. Uh, We will uh, have four points of application uh, today. Uh, And that is, uh, first, we will look at state brambles, church brambles, household brambles, and Christ, the antithesis of a bramble. And so first, let's consider, um, uh, before we can really dive into that application, we must consider uh, this text from a historical and exegetical perspective. I I know that uh, Judges is probably not your favorite book of the Bible, uh, and this is probably not a text you've read in a long time, or that you have memorized in in a VBS at some point in your life. Uh, And so we must must consider some background to this uh, uh, relatively unknown passage. Uh, First, we must remind ourselves that the book of Judges... Uh, is written to argue for the necessity of the Davidic monarchy uh, due to the rampant wickedness and the covenant unfaithfulness of the Israelites. 
It was written to show God's people how their only desire should be for God and His anointed to rule over them. If they go their own way, as we see in the book of Judges, it always ends up in destruction. It always ends up in destruction. When God chooses to act and to save them, it always works out for their good. That's what we see in the book. Uh, Why in the world, then, would they want to follow anyone other than God and His anointed? Right? Our text in Judges 9, this parable, 9 through 15, serves as a rebuke for Israel for seeking out a leader of their own choosing, especially the men of Shechem, regarding of uh, regardless of how wicked the ruler was, they chose a ruler of their own choosing that wasn't God and his anointed. We see that Israel would rather have a dictator than follow the Lord in the freedom of the Mosaic law. Our text takes place right after Gideon. You've probably heard that name before. He was one of the judges of Israel. He's a God's appointed judge who freed them from the oppression of the Canaanites that remained in the land. Um, In in 8.22 through 23, after Gideon saves Israel from the Midianites, the text says this. It's very interesting. Listen, Listen to Gideon's attitude. He's not a bramble. Listen to him. The men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, you and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. See the heart of Gideon. He could have said, sure. I want my sons and their grandsons to be kings forever in Israel and to take that power and to use it so we can be, you know, Gideon, you know the sons of Gideon can be known as the most powerful uh, group in the world. No, he said, no, the Lord's going to be your ruler, not me or my sons. He didn't have the heart of a bramble, you see. He had the heart of a true servant of God. He wasn't a man who uh, he, he was a man who didn't seek to lead, but when he was called to it, he answered. Eventually, if you read the story of Gideon. Uh, now Gideon had seventy sons. He had seventy sons. Yep, that's a lot. He had seventy sons. He had many wives. It's probably one of his downfalls. Uh, he had many, many wives. He did also have a son with a concubine in, in Shechem. Uh, And that son, his illegitimate son, was named Abimelech. Um, In the beginning of our chapter, after Gideon dies, Gideon, by the way, was also known as Jerubbaal, uh, for he was one who contended with Baal. Um, So Gideon, Jerubbaal, same person. Um, Abimelech, after Gideon dies, convinces the leaders of Shechem, as a master manipulator, as abusers typically are, uh, that he should rule for wouldn't it be better for him to rule uh, to rule rather than the 70 sons of, of Gideon? Wouldn't that be better for one who you know? And by the way, Abimelech said, my, my mother's a, a Shechemite, so I, I'm one of you. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be better for me to rule? And so he convinces them to help him kill his 70 brothers. And, and, and by the way, the men of Shechem were not good people. These were not Yahweh worshipers. These were uh, uh, committed Baal worshipers. They were wicked men. So they were convinced by Abimelech, the bramble, and conspired with him to kill all of Gideon's legitimate sons. And they succeeded with this task, other than one. One man got away. One of the sons got away, and his name is Jotham. And Jotham hid himself... And our text is a parable that Jotham uses to rebuke the men of Shechem uh, for what they have done, and rebuke Abimelech, of course, by uh, supporting and aiding um, this uh, wicked oppressor. As well, of course, it's a, it's a rebuke on the wicked oppressor himself. Um, also, exegetically, uh, considering our specific text, uh, this, uh, in this parable we must ask the question, What does the olive tree, the fig tree, and the vine have in common? Does the olive tree, the fig tree, and the vine have in common? Uh, Notice that the trees uh, come and ask them, will will you rule over us? They all say no. The vine, the fig tree, the olive tree. Why? They were content in their position. They were content in their position. 
They were content with their station in life. They didn't desire more power and control. They submitted to what God made them to be and what their role was in the hierarchy of God's creation. Uh, They didn't have an unjust desire for power and control over others. Uh, They were not like Mick Jagger, uh, who, as he sang in his 1966 hit, Under My Thumb, It's down to me, yes it is. The way she does just what she's told, down to me. The change has come. She's under my thumb. The whole song, the the whole song, good song, not the lyrics, but a good song. Uh, One of my favorite Rolling Stones songs, actually. Uh, But the lyrics are terrible. The whole song is about how she used to have control over him, but now he has her under his thumb. Now he gets to control her and boss her around and treat her however he wants. And he's he's like, praise the Lord, she's under my thumb now. I I have all the control and power in the relationship. Um, Very unhealthy, toxic relationship, to say the least. Uh, They didn't have this desire to rule, like Mick Jagger, uh, and control for their own selfish gain. As the vine said, excuse me, as the vine says, why should I leave my wine that cheers God and men and go hold sway over the trees? Why should I do that? I'm, I'm content in my station in life. I have a particular authority, a particular role, and I'm happy with that. I don't need more. I don't need more authority. I have a purpose. I have a goal. I have a particular domain that I have authority in, and I'm going to stick to that. Um, now, what's the difference with the bramble? What's the difference with the bramble? The bramble wants a position of power. And take note, this wasn't a position, a position anyone was hiring for. Take note of that. Uh, this, this was the time of the judges. God had not appointed a king in Israel. Gideon was not a king. And even if he was, God didn't appoint the bramble Abimelech uh, to be uh, in power uh, over anyone. And so the bramble takes advantage of those who are vulnerable, who want leadership, those who want leadership, but seek it out in the wrong place, from the wrong person or people, and in the wrong way. The bramble says... Come under my branches for shade. Remember, there's a thorn bush. Come under my branches for shade. And then notice what he says at the end. Notice what the bramble says in the parable. And by the way, if you don't, I will destroy you. Come come for shade. I'll comfort you. But if you don't, I'll set fire to the whole place. I'll burn it all down. That's a bramble. That's a bramble. A man who does not get, if he does not get the authority and the control and the power over others that he desires, he'll destroy it. He'll destroy it. He will do anything to get his own way. I will destroy you. So you see that the bramble makes you think that you're making the decision. But in reality, the bramble doesn't give you a choice, they give you an impossible ultimatum. That make it extremely difficult for victims uh, to be set free from their grasp. As we will talk more in our application time. Brambles suck the life out of those that they have authority over. And this is why Jotham is rebuking Shechem. They aided and abetted Abimelech, bringing fire upon their own heads. And that's how the passage ends. Abimelech dies by a woman throwing a rock over a tower. And he says... He tells the guy next to him, he's almost dead, but he tells the guy next to him, stab me so no one says I'm, I'm, I was killed by a woman. It's funny because, ironically, it's written in the scriptures that a woman did kill him, and he said that, so it's kind of funny. But <clears throat> God uh, has a sense of humor. Uh, but uh, Abimelech's evil came upon his own head, and God brought the evil of the Shechemites upon their own heads as well. Authority was stripped away from those who sought it out for their own wicked uh, gain and uh, selfish desires. Uh, so so now, how do we apply a text like this? A weird parable in the middle of Judges 9. How do we apply a text like this? So while there, there are, of course, as many ways to do that, I think probably the, the best way uh, to apply this text that is talking about the desire for control and power and the abuse of it, certainly, uh, it's best to apply this to the three primary spheres of government uh, that God has given to mankind for the good of mankind. And that is the state, the church, and the household or the family. Those are three spheres of sovereignty, as they're often called, three 
uh, governments that God has given to mankind for our good, with all three, sometimes overlapping, but three different purposes uh, that benefit mankind in, in different ways. The state, the church, and the family. So let's, let's consider this. Let's consider first state brambles, how our text can help us uh, identify state brambles. Uh, we'll consider some illustrations, uh, and we will um, rebuke state brambles, see how we can rebuke them. Uh, and, and whatnot. So let's let's consider consider this. Notice our, our second reading was Amos four, Amos four, and that helps us understand what uh, what state brambles are like. Of, certainly, our text does as well in Judges nine. Uh, but but notice the beginning of Amos four. Hear this, you cows of Bashan, you who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. Uh, these are uh, individuals, particularly he's talking about women here, uh, but throughout the book, men are thrown under the bus as well. It's everyone in the society. At the top of the society, and the, the wealthy politicians and the ruling class uh, were certainly crushing the needy. They were using their power and their wealth and their control uh, to oppress and to crush uh, those under them. Uh, and certainly that is one way to identify a state bramble. Do they oppress or crush the needy uh, for the sake of their own gain? For the sake of their own gain? Um, are they making policies that, them, that they themselves do not follow whatsoever? That's a good question. If you see a, another way, if you see a politician in your country making significantly more than their annual income, you can be sure they're abusing their power, can't you? for their own personal gain. There's no question politicians in this country make deals with corporations and lobbyists to make themselves richer at the expense of the citizens of the nation. So it happens all over the world. It happens here as well. There's a whole ecosystem, call it the swamp, surrounding this in the capital. Now, there's certainly no question there are plenty of brambles in America in positions of power all around us in this country. And the consequences of state brambles are detrimental. We have plenty of examples in history, emperors and rulers who oppress the poor and crush the needy so they can continue their lifestyle and their luxurious palaces, being fed grapes by all their concubines and whatnot, as the picture usually is. Uh, there are many illustrations in the Bible. Pharaoh, for example, great illustration of a bramble. Pharaoh, a bramble. These Hebrews are getting... Uh, they're having too many kids. So what do I have to do? I have to make them slaves. And I have to kill all the boys. Because I might lose some power and control if I let this continue. He's a bramble. Parliament. Kind of controversial. The Parliament during the War of Independence. Bramble. They were brambles. Uh, they uh, unjustly uh, claimed authority uh, over the people of the New World that they simply did not have the right to. Uh, they were unjustly claiming, um, expanding their authority uh, that, was, um, that was certainly unjust. Uh, now, state brambles uh, must be rebuked. They must be rebuked, and people must speak up. Uh, Proverbs sixteen twelve says this, It is an abomination for kings to do evil, for the throne is established in righteousness. It's abomination, an abomination for kings to do evil, for the throne is established in righteousness. See, no government is established by wicked rulers. No government's going to go very far and do very well with wicked men in positions of power. And so governments need to know, including ours, that Psalm 33, as Psalm 33 says, that the nation whose God is the Lord will be blessed. That's the nation that will be blessed, whose God is the Lord. All nations must bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly, my friends, we're kidding ourselves if we think our leaders are capable of being anything other than brambles if they do not bow the knee to the Lord Jesus. What is the heart of the natural man, as Scripture teaches? How could there be anything other than a bramble? We must speak up, certainly, as the apostles did to our wicked rulers, that we must obey God rather than men. That there is another king, Jesus and we must proclaim that there is a day of judgment coming. For there is a king of kings and a lord of lords. 
And when he comes back, kings of this earth, presidents, congresspeople, rulers, emperors of various kinds, as Revelation says, will hide themselves under rocks at the coming of our Lord Jesus. For us who believe, it is a day of relief. For those who do not, as Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1, for those who do not obey the gospel, the gospel of our Lord Jesus, it is, a day, it is a day of vengeance. And so, having considered state brambles, let's, let's look at church brambles. Uh, and our third scripture lesson will help us with that. That was James chapter 2. James chapter 2. This will help us identify this behavior in the church context. First, brambles in the church, and this can also apply certainly to state brambles or household brambles as well, certainly, uh, but especially in the church. They are uh, those who are not quick to hear, are not slow to speak, are not slow to anger. They are not individuals who receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save our souls. They are not doers of the word, they are hearers only who deceive themselves. There are people who look in the mirror and they may see themselves for a time, but when they walk away, they immediately forget what they look like. You see, meaning they they forget the sin that they just saw and therefore remain unrepentant. Brambles or oppressors, those who abuse authority, are hearers only, since they are blinded to the detrimental effects of their actions. And why is this the case? Well, because the pain of not having their sinful desires fulfilled outweighs the desire to please God. So they go right back to seeking power and control in an unjust way. And even more specifically, church brambles are those whose religious life is not pure and undefiled before God. Why? Well, they have no care for the poor and the needy, as James 1 and 2 talks about. They have no care for the orphans and the widows. Some brambles may do outward things that make us believe that they really care for those who are in need, uh, but in their heart they truly have no concern. Outside the church, they're, com- they're a completely different person. This is a bramble, one who lacks in- uh, integrity. As, uh, it could also be a person, as 2.16 says, who, who say, Go in peace, be warm and filled, but actually are completely unwilling to do anything practical Uh, that would help anyone at all. Uh, Furthermore, of course, church brambles uh, in leadership, I I will say a a church bramble doesn't have to be in leadership to be a a church bramble, Uh, but one who is in leadership, an elder or a deacon, a pastor, um, these sorts of brambles, they preach, teach, and lead all for their own benefit, all for the sake of their own gain. They're not like our Lord. They're not like our Lord who said, I came to serve, not to be served. They led in a domineering way for shameful gain, as Peter rebukes in 1 Peter 5. Do not lead for shameful gain, he says, implying there's many that do. Now, the consequences of church brambles are plenty. It tears churches apart. Uh, Many of us have seen this firsthand. Um, certainly. Um, there's many examples in the last 10, 20 years. Mark Driscoll's church, for example, he was a bramble, and that whole thing uh, blew up, if you're familiar with that. It's plaguing the church all around us as well, right now, through the prosperity gospel, charismatic preachers uh, who take advantage of the poor and crush the needy, uh, and especially in poorer countries, uh, places in Africa, for example. Um, but, but it happens in our own circles as well, uh, certainly. Uh, we, um, we are in a presbytery. Uh, in our presbytery, I have seen cases um, uh, that have charged pastors who are brambles uh, and have seen this uh, firsthand. Church brambles that our leaders need to know, they need to know that they will be charged with harsher judgment. If you are a bramble to God's people, you will, uh, you should be shaking in your boots Uh, begging God's forgiveness, pleading the blood of Christ, because if you remain unrepentant, it will not go well for you. As Hebrews 13 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. A leader will have to give an account for those under his charge. I do not want to be a bramble leader and have to give an account 
uh, for those I was in authority over. It's a dangerous place to be in. You will be a called. You will be called to account on Judgment Day as a shepherd of the flock. Now, if you are a victim of a church bramble or brambles, uh, you must speak up. This is actually a biblical requirement. It's very countercultural, but victims must speak up. It's a biblical requirement. Uh, you need biblical evidence, certainly. Uh, if a claim is against an elder, uh, as Paul says in 1 Timothy 5, uh, you must uh, do it with two to three witnesses, as the Scriptures state. Uh, the Bible is clear about this, though. Victims are responsible to speak up and to speak out. And yes, that takes courage. That takes courage, that takes wisdom uh, to do something uh, like this. Um, and now some people who are overly critical will find a bramble everywhere. You know these people. They will find a bramble everywhere simply because someone says something they don't like or maybe they rebuke them and use their authority in a proper sense um, and they don't like it. So that person's a bramble. Uh, If you're going to speak up, you must make sure you're actually a victim of real abuse, the real abuse of authority. And it's not simply your feelings are hurt or a lack of proper communication. Nevertheless, victims must speak up. And as Presbyterians, you have a a balance of powers. You have a a multitude of of elders. Uh, You have a presbytery, which is the higher court. You have the General Assembly, which is an even higher court. And and so I I will say this. Thankfully, I don't think and don't believe you have to worry about this at at this church uh, at all. Uh, But we still must be on guard when it comes to to the abuse of authority. Uh, for it happens often and all around us in various ways. I I also have to clarify something here and be careful. Um, Our culture currently hates all forms of authority. It hates all forms of authority. The only rule they will accept is their own autonomous rule. That's our culture. It's it's my way or the highway. Me, myself, and I. Uh, And this is certainly an unbiblical perspective. It's detrimental to society. It's detrimental to churches. It's had a big effect on churches uh, and households. You see, authority is not the problem. Authority is not the problem. Abuse of authority is the problem. Abuse of authority is the problem. So when we speak out against a bramble, we must make sure we're speaking out against an actual bramble, an actual oppressive person who is abusing his authority for the sake of his own personal gain, typically using anger through various manipulation tactics in order to get their own way, regardless of its effects on those under his charge. That's a bramble. That's a bramble. Now let's consider household brambles. Household brambles. First remember that a bramble is one who seeks control at all costs. They seek control at all costs, no matter its effect on on the members of their household or the members of their church or the or the citizens of their country. A bramble, especially in this household context, is often called an abuser uh, or an oppressor. Both are fine terms. And abuse uh, can happen in multiple ways, using multiple different tactics. Uh, This is especially true in the home, uh, but it it applies to state brambles and church church brambles as well. And it it could be physical. That's the easiest one to see, maybe. Physical. It could be sexual. To be spiritual, psychological, which is another way of saying emotional abuse. All of these forms of abuse can clearly be proven uh, from Scripture in our confession. Physical abuse is clear. Sexual abuse is often clear, maybe, maybe not as, as, as physical. Um, but spiritual and emo- emotional abuse uh, can be a bit more tricky to identify. So that's where most of my focus will be now. Spiritual and emotional abuse. Abuse. An emotional abuser uses harshness, uh, the silent treatment, gaslighting, gaslighting, which refers to when an abuser convinces a victim that they are crazy, uh, and that they're looking at everything wrong, uh, when in fact they're not crazy and, and the person is truly abusing them. Uh, many of you probably don't know the origin of that term, by the way. It, I think last year it was, the, it, it was the word of the year, the Oxford Dictionary, I think, the word of the year. But where does it come from? Gaslighting. It might, might be helpful quickly to bring, to bring this up. Um, it's not just a Gen Z term. It's actually pretty useful. Um, it comes from a 1944 film called Gaslight. 
about a woman who was manipulated by her husband um, into thinking that she was crazy. Um, at that time, if you turn on the lights in one room, you only had a certain amount of gas. I don't know this from experience. <laughs> you only had a certain amount of gas. And so if you turn the light on in one room, the lights would dim in the other rooms. Okay? Um, and so he would tell her uh, that he's leaving. He's leaving. But it, instead, he actually would go into the attic. He would turn the light in the attic, and all the lights would dim. And she would say, no one else is in the house. What's happening? But I know the lights are dimming. And the reason he's going in the attic is, is because it was her family home, and there's something very valuable up, up there. That's why he married her. He's an abuser. He married her just for her money. So there's something very valuable up there that he's searching for. Um, and so he convinces her that she's crazy. She's seen things. She's, it's in her head. It's not real. Uh, in reality, he was abusing her. He was manipulating her and lying to her, making her feel like she's crazy for the sake of his own selfish gain. In this case, money that he was trying to find in the attic. Uh, that is a gaslighter, and this is what emotional abusers often do. This is a, a common tactic. Um, abusers of this sort also will typically defile the marriage bed. It's very common. Uh, this could be anything from intimacy with, without it, consent, uh, all the way to things that are too vile to discuss here. Uh, to be brief, abusers of this sort manipulate, have harsh tongues, provoke, guilt trip, gaslight, all to keep their spouse under their thumb. They often isolate, isolate their, spy, uh, their spouse uh, from family, from the church, uh, from others around them to prevent any sort of intervention uh, from ever being able to happen. Uh, the PCA, our denomination, did a study report on this topic a few years back, and it defined it this way, which is very helpful. Emotional abuse is any non-physical behavior designed uh, to control someone through degradation, humiliation, and or fear. But you may have noticed that many of the sins I listed are sins that we all have committed. We've all been like this at times. Uh, so how do we tell the difference between a true abuser and someone who is falling into sins like this? Um, how can we tell the difference? How does it become a problem to the point of this is an oppressive person, an actual abuser? Uh, the study report continues, what makes the sinful behavior abusive is that it is a repeated, persistent pattern of sin over a prolonged period that causes significant and lasting damage. Significant and lasting damage. An individual who perpetrates repeated, persistent sins of abuse must not be dismissed as someone who sometimes loses his cool. That's what the report says. Very helpful. The consequences of, of brambles uh, like this are, are plenty. Uh, his prayers will be hindered, as First Peter talks about. His family uh, may be taken from him. Um, and, and also, he, he may not truly know the Lord, for he is living in persistent sin, as First John talks about. And so these abusers are out there, and we must be aware of them. Uh, and, and it must be noted, it's not always men. Statistically, uh, it's more common, but it's not always men. Scriptures talk about this. There's a reviling woman, reviling wives, uh, who uh, every chance they get trash their husbands, discourage them, um, and um, are like the, like the leaky roof, as the proverb says. Um, that's a reviling wife, and we need to be on guard for that. As well, And so, brothers and sisters, if you know anyone who's being abused in any way, you must speak up. We're called to do this. Isaiah 117, correct oppression. Seek justice, correct oppression. And if you are a victim, the hardest thing to do is certainly to speak up, especially of this sort of manipulation. Because probably you've been, been manipulated for years and years, and you do think you're crazy and the husband's not. Um, but you must speak up when you realize that something is seriously wrong. And this church is certainly not one to play around with any sort of abuse, any sort of Abimelech in our midst. Uh, we will hear your story. Um, uh, it takes a lot of courage to speak up about abuse of any kind. And if this is you, you probably feel shame, like you don't have a voice, like no one will believe you. Um, you may have had bad experiences at some churches where they don't hear you and they're not listening. Um, and they just believe the master manipulator that is your husband. But I assure you, at this church, we, we're aware of emotional abuse, uh, various kinds of abuse, for that matter, and take it very seriously. And so trust in the Lord. Speak up. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. 
Um, and I know it's countercultural, but the Bible commands you, if you are a victim, you must speak up. You must speak up. Now Christ. Christ. Briefly. No matter uh, who you are and how the sermon has applied to you th- this morning, this point is for all of you. If you are a victim, the oppressor, or someone helping a victim or an oppressor, know this, that Christ is king. Uh, he has all authority in heaven and on earth. Uh, he hu- upholds the universe by the word of his power. And yet, what, what do the scriptures say about Jesus our Lord, our master, our king? Philippians 2, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but humbled himself, even to the point of death, even death on a cross. In Mark 9, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Christ, the antithesis of a bramble. Matthew 23, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. In Luke The disciples are arguing who's going to be the greatest among them. And Jesus says, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over you, and those in authority over them and all all their benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as the one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I among you as the one who serves. You see, Jesus could have been a bramble. He could have been. He had all the power to do so. But instead, he chose meekness. Which, by the way, is not weakness. Meekness is power restrained. It's power restrained. And this is how we are to lead, my friends. God has placed all of us in places of authority. Um, And authority is not the issue. The abuse of leadership roles and authority is the issue. We must lead with meekness. Um... This doesn't mean you cannot be powerful and strong and courageous. Uh, It simply means uh, that we must restrain that power and use it in the right context at the right time. There were times Jesus unleashed and when he flipped all the tables and made whips and chased people out of the temple. There's a time for that. Uh, There's a time for a leader uh, to uh, be very intense and to protect the flock in that sort of way. Um, but you must make sure you're using that power and strength of your authority in the right way and in the, at the right time and in a godly, with a godly heart. Um, as one pastor put it, you are called, and this is in the context of husbands and wives, you are called to be hard for your wives, not hard on your wives. That's a good one, isn't it? You're called to be hard for your wives, not on your wives. And so, my friends, do you lead like Christ? Um, or do you lead like Christ? Or do you suck the life out of others for the sake of your own selfish desire? Or do you build your neighbor up, be content with your position and your God-given calling and the bounds of his definition of the authority that he has given you in life? These are the questions we have to ask ourselves. And we must be more like Christ, who is the antithesis of the bramble. Uh, Let's pray together. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your great grace that you have bestowed upon all of us. And as we partake of the supper now, I pray that you would be here with us uh, as we are nourishing us as we partake of this marvelous communion with one another. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.